Hey there. Uh, we'll be speaking on behalf of Professor Benzlik, who unfortunately couldn't make it, but I will be presenting his slides that we uh, uh, carefully discussed in advance. So uh, let's go into uh, the first slide. <coughs> Uh, where I have my disclosures is that I have a grant from the University of Amsterdam uh, and the uh, Patient Federation uh, that founded uh, my salary. And the projects uh, that I will be talking on are also sponsored by industry, uh, the University of Amsterdam and uh, also Patient Federations. Then first there are some uh, important questions that I always like to ask people and that uh, really introduces the topic that we are talking on. And in the end, I think you will be um, convinced that we can safely expand the boundaries of robotic cardiac to do the next week. But first, we have to um, confront ourselves. So I would like to so do some show of hands first. Uh, who knows the next set of rules? Eat when you can, sleep when you can, and don't mess with pancreas. <laughs> I know this phrase. I know anyone else knows it. Yes, okay. I think many of you do mess with the pancreas, but let's, let's continue to the next question. Can we get that next slide? Thank you. So, uh, what do you think your patient would prefer? Would that be uh, procedure simulated training? Yeah. Uh, would, you, would you prefer a patient, uh, would your patient prefer procedure simulated training, like they do in aviation, when you have this expensive simulator, and or do you think your patient would prefer the, the, the basic approach we use C1, C1, D1? Uh, show of hands if you think procedure simulated training. Show of hands if you C1, D1, D1. Anyone in the room, C1, D1, D1? Uh, then we go to the next question. Uh, then there are some questions that maybe I ask myself when I'm thinking about setting up a new study. study because why would we make an operation that is already quite difficult more difficult with minimally invasive tissues? I think that's really important because pancreas surgery requires a very large incision. Uh, there are numerous complications, but one very important is the wound complication. These are important because the patient will stay in the hospital for longer with all the risks involved that, that the hospital state has. I don't have to explain this in this setting in this audience. And then, more importantly, for oncology reasons, is that if you have an infection of this wound, how can you start up the chemotherapy? I don't think your um, gastroenterologist or oncologist will do this, especially in the Netherlands. They are quite careful with that. Then we can move to the next slide, please. So, there are numerous studies that are assessing this effect. For distal pancreatectomy, we established um, evidence that is quite solid. For pancreas to do the nectomy, there is evidence as well. Uh, but there are some concerns on the learning curve. So let's move forward. So then we ask the question, why should we spend time on the training while I think this audience already has an extensive experience in HPV surgery? So it's really important to clarify that the new technique, the new instruments that we have, are really new. For example, old surgical instruments were already in hieroglyphs in Egypt. So we think of this simple vascular clamp was already used for, um, for some procedures they did in Egypt. I can explain later on why, but I don't think I have to mention it here. And then uh, the performance that you see with these new instruments, for example, laparoscopic nephrectomies, they have very long learning curves. So this is the first introduction of this basically in Japan. And uh, there are uh, master, then his apprentice, and then later on a student that uh, also learns their technique. And you see that there is some transfer of the experience, but still, it is a learning curve of over, uh, this one is 1,500 cases. And this is further supported by a paper of John Cameron, who says, after 2,000 pancreatic duodenectomies open, I am still learning. So we did this worldwide survey that you all already saw on liver surgery, we did it also on uh, pancreatic surgery. And 44% of surgeons in the world that, uh, that responded to the survey, they said, we don't do minimally invasive pancreatic duodenectomy simply because we don't have training. And of course, we all know the Miami guidelines uh, on minimally invasive pancreatic resection. And uh, now recently, the EMIPS guidelines, for which uh, Professor Mo Aguilo, uh, hi, Professor, uh, 
uh, also uh, further establishes and validated this statement is that we need training, we recommend fellowships, and we need to consider team training. Let's move to the next slide. So in the Netherlands we tried laparoscopic to do the And we, we asked why spend <coughs> on a robotic system instead of just really good laparoscopic in instruments. We use 3D instruments, we use very expensive vascular uh, uh, staplers, well, all, all the things you can imagine. But still, the mortality in the Netherlands was 10% in the, in the laparoscopic arm, 5% in the open arm. So they decided to stop the trial, stop laparoscopic pancreas to do the neck to unfortunately. When we looked at the videos of these procedures, because we recorded them all, and we graded them by experts from around the world on laparoscopic pancreas to do the neck and also open, they said that 22% of these videos shows technical performance below adequate. That's something to really consider. So let's move on to the next slide. What, what, what was then my assignment? <coughs> to start up and coordinate the training program for robotic <coughs> surgery. So this started in 2016 and ran in, up till 2021. We used a step-up approach and we reported uh, the impact of these learning curves and we, uh, we reported an analysis comparing the open cohort propensity score match, correcting for risk factors. So you see this amazing uh, group of proctors that we were fortunate to have in our training settings. Let's move to the next slide. So what should you consider step up? I think the first thing we should do, and what we did, is this uh, basic simulation training that you also see in aviation. So this is a full day of performance on the simulator. 90% scores have to be reached before moving on. Uh, can you do one more click? I think then you see also the... Oh, okay, the other video is not playing. Anyhow, um, let's move forward. Then they receive this uh, great video database. For example, in aviation, you, you get... Um, failure training. So when there is an incident, they, uh, they have this as a training material so that a beginning pilot can see what was the mishap, how could it be prevented, and why did we implement these steps. So this is very important for bleeding cases, for different anatomy, and Melissa Hoax provided a great database that is on YouTube. I can share the link with you as well, but it's in like a secret part. Let's move on. So then I was fortunate to work with a group from uh, Heidelberg to develop the biotissues further and make something that I think is very, uh, very useful for biotissue training that is almost like the real deal. It's artificial organs made from silicon and you can use it because we want you to feel with the robot. You cannot feel with the robot, so you, you make some mistakes on this material but still we are protecting the patient from these mistakes. And uh, this way you can really see the traction you put on the materials, and we hope we can translate that to the patient setting as well. And I'm going to show you that we did. Let's move on to the next slide. Because then the surgeons got this app uh, to have protocols and do their first uh, cases that were on HPV level. You can, for example, go to cystectomy, dystectomy, <coughs> And then they, if they felt adequate, and uh, they did all the biotissue, they did all the simulator exercises, they could start their first robotic pancreatobulinectomy with a proctor. Next slide, please. Here you see Melissa Ho, and she is now the bedside ass assistant. I, unfortunately, the video is not working, but the bedside assist assistant of the first surgeon in the Netherlands, uh, one of the first surgeons in the Netherlands, proctored by Melissa Ho. And it, it's, it's really amazing to, to see that this procedure, of course, takes very long, but after that there is a steep learning curve, um, because I think we, we really um, use also the community of our training group to discuss how we can improve this further with group meetings. Let's move on to the next slide. Well, I told you a lot on, how we, on our method, so let's move on to the results, to some data. First, the learning curves. Uh, we found that the operative time learning curve, the complication learning curve, and the textbook outcome learning curve 
was uh, very um, um, significantly shorter compared to the literature. Uh, for example, here we see, next slide please, here we see the learning curve for operative time in a QSIM analysis. So that means that if you perform below average, or in this case you operate longer, the line will go upward. If you perform uh, above average, so in this case you have less operative time, then the line will go downward. In the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center that we uh, had the honor to discuss earlier, there you see a learning curve of around 80 cases. And you see this, this is a very high effect. In the Lay Lab Street cohort, where we did the training, you see that this learning curve is 15 procedures. And the impact is very low. So let's move forward. That was on operative time. Then we wanted to know, is this effect also adequate in the Dutch setting? So we have good outcomes with the robot, but still there are a lot of P9 cases. Only 23% uh, PDAC cases, so you expect a lot of soft pancreases and a lot of complications from fistula, for example, or bleeding. Our major morbidity was similar to that of the open cohort in the propensity to score matched data set of around 500 cases. Also, mortality and failure to rescue were adequate, adequate and similar. Um, still, we had to do for safety measures and also for our own knowledge, how high should someone perform on these anastomoses. We still found some room for improvement there, but we'll discuss this later. Let's move forward. Because we had a lot of people, uh, surgeons, and also of course intuitive who like this a lot, uh, that wanted to know how can we do this in Europe, because we can move to the Netherlands, we want this training to come to our center. And that is uh, something where we had better simulators, because we are moved forward in time, we have better biotissue materials thanks to the Heidelberg Center, and now also a better trainer, Leah Jones, and she is one of the PhDs of Mark Besslink and Mohamed Abubilal. And she is working on protecting the patients, again in Europe, from the learning curve of robotic pancreatic redenectomy. Uh, the primary outcome is the learning curve, and secondary, do these training performances that I showed you earlier on video uh, analysis, do they correlate with the outcomes? And can we set a standard for what a surgeon should do before they operate on the patient? It's an important question that will take time to investigate, but of, uh, luckily we have a very large group that helps us, and we have two more positions that we could fill. Um, so this is the LearnBot group that uh, participated in all the prop training and biotechnology training. Let's move forward. Then when the LearnBot program is full, then unfortunately uh, people cannot participate anymore. If you would like to still see the robotic pancreatic duodenectomy and get a feel for the training program, then it is possible to do a visit to the Netherlands for five days where you can see five robotic pancreatic duodenectomies. So five days, five RP days. And it's also a very rare opportunity to eat croquette. I don't know, it's very mysterious. Nobody really knows what's in there. Quite, quite delicious. Let's move on. So boundaries. And we saw very elegant surgeries on vascular reconstruction, vascular reception, liver surgery, pancreatic duodenectomy surgery. Very, thank you so much for my previous speakers to address this. Still, these boundaries that we are discussing also come with new learning curves on themselves, from 80 to 30 cases. We are talking about long operative times that maybe your hospital directory will not permit you to have. And um, we are talking about safety outcomes. Uh, one more slide. So what I did uh, in advance to this talk is I went to um, the expert at <coughs> guidelines meeting on minimally invasive uh, pancreatic surgery and asked them, what would you recommend my audience to do before you embark on expanding these boundaries? Of course, we need a stepwise training program, but for vascular uh, resection and reconstruction, you have to feel confident first to finish an open learning curve on these vascular uh, resections. And that was by Tobias Kahn. And Mark Besseling says, uh, the first 30 cases you do, uh, 40, 
just convert when you see vascular involvement. And after that, you set the conversion set ready, you get your robotic vascular bulldog clamps, and if you feel confident, you might do it. And Melissa Hogg advises that you use the training material available, and you get an assistant always when you are doing vascular resection or reconstruction that is very good at uh, uh, sections of vascular and also very good at minimally invasive cardiac Next slide. So with that, audience and chairman, I would like to conclude that, similar to camera, after 2,000 quadratotudinectomies, we are still learning. So you are never out of the learning curve. And then I would like to rephrase something that if you mess with the pancreas, then see plenty, do plenty, and teach plenty. And finally, we can safely expand the boundaries in robotic quadratotudinectomy, since we have the feasibility that uh, we saw a video earlier, and we learned some Italian as well. We have training, and we know the limits and the impact of the learning curves. Furthermore, we have these performance indicators on video right now, so you can assess yourself and get the tips on your technique. And we have this very large international collaboration, thanks, thanks to also the expertise in Italian. And we have the guidelines that tell us in which direction to move. So, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to uh, answer some questions as well. Thank you. Very much.